Hereby, I open this academic ceremony in which Delia Fernandez de la Fuente will defend the academic thesis, High Throughput Assessment of Platelet Signaling, Function and Inhibition. May I invite you to present a summary of your study and the conclusions of your thesis. Please. Thank you, Director. Dear members of the committee, supervisors, family, friends and colleagues, Today, I would like to give an overview of my joint PhD thesis entitled High Throughput Assessment of Playlist Signaling Function and Inhibition. But first, I would like to start with some questions. How many nose bleeds have you previously had or kitchen cuts? And do you know the mechanism responsible to stop the bleeding? Do you know somebody taking medicines after a heart attack or a stroke? Do you know what effects they cause? Throughout this presentation, I hope um, I will help you understand how the process of bleeding and healing occurs. But for that, I need to explain to you what is the blood. The blood is a fluid that um, it's uh, inside the vessels, such as veins, arteries, or capillaries. It is inside because we have a layer of endothelial cells. And um, in the blood, we have red blood cells that transport the oxygen throughout the body, white blood cells that protect us from pathogens, and platelets that together with molecules in this fluid that are the coagulation factors prevent the body from, from bleeding. The platelets are here represented big, but are the smallest cells in the blood. And uh, in my thesis are uh, the main characters. <laughs> and uh, they are one of the uh, characters in the process of hemostasis. That is the mechanism that the body has to stop the bleeding. It involves uh, several uh, multi, uh, multiple interlinked steps that culminates in the formation of a plaque, and this plaque closes up a wound that is the, the, uh, where the bleeding may occur. But, when, um, because I will focus on the platelets, there are several uh, issues that can cause um, dysfunction in this um, hemostasis. One of them can be a dysfunction of platelet function, and this causes bleeding. One of these uh, bleeding may be because of platelet bleeding disorders that are abnormalities of platelet responses with variable symptoms. They can range from easy bruising um, bleeding after surgery or uh, life-threatening conditions. And these disorders present with difficult diagnosis. On the other side of the coin, we can have hyperactivation of platelet function uh, because of several, um, it can uh, be because of different uh, causes, and this leads to thrombosis. Thrombosis is encompassed in cardiovascular disease, which is the leading cause of morbidity and mortality worldwide, causing one in four deaths. But to explain it in a more pictorial and simple way, if there is a blood loss in a sector, the platelets will start talking to each other, and at the end, they will form a platelet pla party, or how we call it, a platelet plaque. However, this platelet plaque can be really pathological and generate a thromb uh, thrombi that can occlude the vessel and cause heart attack or stroke. For that reason, uh, people with thrombosis get antiplatelet agents to prevent further thrombotic episodes. However, these antiplatelet agents cause an increase of bleeding. So this highlights the, that there is a need to develop newer antiplatelet agents without this risk of bleeding. And to, to uh, be able to develop these uh, antiplatelet agents, we need to dive deeper into platelet activation. As I've been saying, uh, if there is a vessel wall damage, the resting platelets will see collagen. And this collagen can be detected by receptors in the platelet membrane, such as the collagen receptor GP6 or uh, the GP1B receptor that, by the use of bobillion factor, can recognize the damage. Um, another very important receptor in platelets is um, there are the thrombin receptors, PAR1 and PAR4. And thrombin is one of the uh, proteins generated by the coagulation cascade. So by the use of all of these receptors, the platelet get activated and then they close the damage by a um, platelet plaque. However, what are the messengers that uh, tell the platelets that they need to get activated? 
One of the most important messengers is calcium, and through the, through the binding of these molecules to the platelet receptors, there, there is going to be an increased risk of, uh, we, sorry, <laughs> an increased um, intracellular calcium levels, and this calcium can uh, be used also to measure uh, over time the platelet activation. But le this leads me to the aims of my thesis that were to develop and use high-throughput assays to better evaluate the functions and signaling pathways of platelets and to find novel ways of inhibition of platelet functions in disease. The first aim is encompassed in chapter two to five. And in these chapters, I aim to develop a high-throughput assay that can reduce the cost and time of and facilitate the development of novel drugs. So, uh, sorry, this um, assay um, is based on the measurement of calcium signaling. And we um, used first a 96 well plate and isolated platelets. These platelets um, can get activated by the use of agonists that are molecules that activate the platelets. When these platelets get activated, several things happen. But in these platelets, we, we had a calcium dye. And when we activated the platelets, either with collagen-related peptide, that it's a small molecule that uh, simulates collagen, or with thrombin that can bind to the part one and four receptors in the platelets, we will trace the activation through the um, increase of calcium. But as you can see, these two traces are different, so they will help um, differentiate the, the specific pathways. And we chose these two receptors because GP6, it's a... Um, it's a receptor that has been um, suggested as a, a target for safe antiplated agents. And thrombin um, has been uh, previously shown uh, with, um, um, as, an anti, uh, as a target for antiplated um, agents, but they showed an increased uh, risk of bleeding. But when I had this um, method developed in 96 well plate, I downscaled it to 384 well plate and 1536 well plate. And in, in these really uh, tiny wells, <laughs> I uh, perform a small molecule screening with around 16,000 small molecules. And what, we, uh, what I discovered is a molecule that could uh, inhibit the uh, GP6 induced platelet activation, but um, it didn't have any effect with thrombin. This molecule is called ethopropacin hydrochloride, and it was previously uh, used as an um, anti-Parkinson agent. But uh, this uh, highlights that it can be uh, repurposed, reducing the drug discovery and development uh, pipeline. Um, this leads me to the second aim, that was to find novel ways of inhibition of platelet function in disease, and this is encompassed in chapters six to eight. In these chapters, I use a microfluidic whole blood assay uh, to test blood from healthy controls or from patients. Uh, it uh, consisted of, a, of the Maastricht flow chamber, that is a chamber that has a channel and a chip. In the chip, we can place agonist, and in the channel, we can perfuse the blood. When the blood gets in contact with the agonist, we can trace, the, um, we can observe different uh, patterns of thrombus formation with each specific agonist. So in chapter six, I use this method to, for um, uh, phenotyping healthy controls and uh, NUNAM patients. And these patients have a mild bleeding disorder. So, um, they have a mild bleeding disorder because of an hyperactivation of a protein. But we observe that this, um, this mutation causes a reduced uh, thrombus formation and plate activation. However, when we use a, a, a molecule, a SHP099 inhibitor, against this hyperactivated protein, we observe that the thrombus formation and plate activation could be restored. In chapter seven, I focused on the GP1B receptor and its binding to bombillion factor. This um, bombillion factor form multimers, and in some cases, 
uh, these multimers are hyperactive, causing uh, thrombotic uh, diseases. So we wanted to find drugs that can be can interfere with this um, with this interaction, and for that we used in silico tools that are computer-based tools that help us puzzle drugs into proteins. And as you can see here, the purple uh, protein <laughs> um, will only bind to the yellow piece. So uh, we did this and we selected several uh, drugs. And when we tested them in the microfluidic assay, we observed a reduced thrombus formation with both of these drugs. In um, chapter eight, I also use uh, this method to, um, for patients with an inherited bleeding disorder, and some of them presented uh, an unclear platelet function diagnostics. So the question was if the whole blood microfluidic uh, method could aid in the phenot uh, phenotyping of these patients. So from these uh, patients, and we also had healthy controls and relatives without bleeding symptoms, we collected blood cell values, standard platelet function tests, and molecular genetic analysis that were unclear for some of these patients. Uh, we also collected blood to perform the multiparameter whole blood flow assay and analyzed all the images collected from this method. Uh, with all this data, we use an integrative analysis to um, uh, to analyze what uh, if we could separate uh, all these um, all these uh, patients and healthy controls, and what we observe is that the blue individuals are represented here were controls and asymptomatic relatives. The red ones had mild bleeding symptoms with reduced platelet function, and the green ones had mild bleeding symptoms with reduced platelet function and low platelet count. And this was um, observed only by using the data. And finally, this leads me to the conclusions that were the development and validation of a high throughput platelet calcium assay that can differentiate between GP6 and PAR signaling, identify of a novel GP6 inhibitor. The use of a microfluidic assay in drug discovery that helped us to find that SHP-099 can restore platelet function in non and patient's blood and uh, help in the development of novel cyclic peptides interfering with mobilian factor GP1B. And the last conclusion is that the microfluidic assay was used to characterize platelet bleeding disorders because it, was, um, it differentiated patients from healthy family members. And with that, I would like to acknowledge all my collaborators, uh, especially my supervisors and all blood donors. And uh, um, thank you very much for listening. And I would like to give back the word to the director. Thank you very much for this uh, presentation. No applause yet. Please. Um, we will start the opposition of your thesis. And the opposition will be opened by Professor Dr. Hanen. And Professor Dr. Hanen is Professor of Redox Modulation of Pharmacological and Toxicological Processes at this university, of the Maastricht University. And he is Chair of the Assessment Committee, but also Secretary to this, uh, to this academic session. Professor Hanen. Okay, thank you, Mr. Prorector. Uh, dear candidate, first of all, I'd like to congratulate you on the completion of your thesis and in microcultivation. I would, ask, uh, uh, would also like to include your PZ theme. I've read your thesis with great interest. I was very impressed by the broadness of your thesis that included also an ultra throughput assay you developed and the testing of more than 60,000 compounds. You identified three head compounds that you priori prioritized for further characterization. Now, I myself, I'm trained as a medicinal chemist, and therefore my primary focus is on the molecular structure and how this relates to the activity. When I look at the structure of the three hits depicted on page 116, 117, and 118, the molecular structure of these hits is quite different. And as you also mentioned, the molecular mechanism of these compounds might not be the same. Can you explain to me what the difference in mode of action of these compounds is? Um, highly esteemed opponent, thank you for the compliment and for the question. 
Um, uh, yes, <laughs> so all these uh, compounds are different, um, but uh, one of them, uh, it's a thrombin inhibitor. Uh, at least in the first assay, we observed that it was uh, only inhibiting specifically the thrombin-induced platelet activation. Um, the other two are uh, GP6 inhibitor, although the AF299, as I uh, name it, it's uh, less specific. And as we observed in the uh, in a PRP, it also have a high plasma bound uh, capability. So, um, so <laughs> yeah. Uh, and the last one, it uh, yeah, it, uh, it it we observed that it was specific to to the GP6 pathway. Um, however, this last compound, it um, it has been described previously to bind several other molecules, also in uh, neurons and, and uh, NMDA channels and butyrylcholinesterase inhibitors. So uh, in platelets, it may bind specifically uh, to GP6, although uh, further studies need to prove that, because of course we didn't uh, do binding assays. Um, but uh, that is because platelets don't have NMDA channels because I uh, attacked uh, myself trying to stimulate the platelets with glutamate, mm. and I could not observe any signal. Um, mm. So, um, uh, yeah. Okay. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Now, to your work will be continued, of course, and um, you said that uh, uh, after identifying the etopropazine as an interesting compound, uh, you, su you suggested that we need a structural activity relationship. Yeah, on page 266, you said this. And the structural activity relationship is very helpful. It helps us to understand the mechanism. Moreover, you can use it to help you to identify compounds with the most potent desirable effect. Um, how would you proceed to get this structural activity relationship of the etopropocene? Um, so first, I will contact a chemist that can help me <laughs> with uh, developing, um, yeah. yeah, generating further modifications mm -hmm. of the compounds. Um, there are uh, quite some uh, phenothiazines um, mm -hmm. available. So also buying some of those compounds might help identifying mm -hmm. the um, uh, functional group of the molecule and uh, which of the rest are not necessary for the binding um, or for the effect. Yeah. Of course, um, you've, you've do you have to test the compounds? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you can test them in this essay? Yeah, yeah, because uh, it's very easy and very fast. <laughs> mm, yeah, yeah. Um, but in your first answer, you said, uh, well, there are several pathways which, in, which yeah. compounds can use to inhibit. Yeah. Now, in constructing a structural activity relationship, it's quite helpful if you look at only at one mechanism. Mm -hmm. So if you have several mechanisms, you get probably a mixed up of several structural activity yeah, relationships. Yeah. So would you think your essay is quite... Uh, capable of constructing a structural activity relationship? Yeah, so um, that's a good point. <laughs> um, well, it, uh, it really depends. Um, but uh, the thing is, we would have to really uh, um, target the assay. So we, we should have, uh, we should test all the agonies that are um, mm -hmm. potent enough to trigger a calcium release, yeah. uh, test the compound and see if one of these agonies, it gives us a very specific response. Mm -hmm. um, I would say it's very difficult. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah. And that's what we say, uh, every elegnadal hepsovoidal, so every disadvantage can also have a advantage. And as my Chinese colleagues say, everything has yin and yang. <laughs> so you might also ask, argue that the essay has the advantage to look at different effects and different compounds. Yeah, so you can identify a lot of compounds that act on different mechanisms. Mm -hmm. yeah. But if you think further, you might also perhaps use this disadvantage or advantage, how you call this, mm -hmm. or characteristic of the essay, mm -hmm. to, to uh, also use this in... Um, in the work of your successor uh, to continue. Mm -hmm. What could you do? Can you use this disadvantage also in your advantage? The, when you go, go further. 
the calcium assay, <laughs> the disadvantages that you mentioned to use it in my advantage to test all this structure activity relation. Um, well, I mean, the only... <laughs> well, I think I can help you a bit. Eh? I can think one of the interesting options is you might try to study combination of compounds that act on yeah, different Yeah, it's, it's what I was thinking. And then yeah. you can see synergistic effects. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. but it's what I tried yeah. in the supplementary figure yeah. to, to try to pinpoint which yeah. was the target protein for, yeah. for this compound. Because uh, since, it's, um, since all these compounds are dissolved in the MSO, mm. then they are more likely to be uh, to target an intracellular protein. So we we know that they target the the pathway, but yeah. we wanted also to know which protein because then yeah. it's also easier to try to modify the compounds. Yeah. Um, but that's difficult in USA because you always yeah 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 yeah, yeah 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 of course. But so I would say, well, don't use this assay for a structure activity relationship, but use it to see if you can have synergistic effects of these compounds. Mm -hmm. So perhaps you can change the uh, the uh, idea you gave to your successor to construct a uh, structural activity relationship on page 266 uh, and refers this to say, well, perhaps it's better to look at combination of compounds. So what would you now recommend your successor? <laughs> to, you to construct a structural activity relationship or to look at synergy of compounds? Yeah, I mean, to, to look at synergy of compounds, <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, I think we agree on this. <laughs> Yeah. I don't know if there's time for another question. A very short question, please. Well, I have a very short question. Okay. <laughs> when I look at the um, figures, the panel C of the figures, mm -hmm. I note that there you have the concentration effect uh, curves. I see that at, at the high concentrations you, see you have a very large standard deviation. So uh, apparently there's something you cannot manage that well or, or reproduce that well in your essay. Have you any idea what causes this? High standard deviation. Um, because that's something striking. At a high concentration, you see a lot of a high standard deviation. At a low concentration, it's quite small. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I don't know. So there's no, something you sh you cannot manage. Mm -hmm. yeah? Yeah, yeah. Perhaps yeah. one idea is might to look at the chemical structure of the compound and to see if it really dissolves at a high concentration. Now, when I look at the ANO61, I think it is not that well dissolved in water. Mm -hmm. So is it really a concentration of 100 micromoles you get when you put it in the essay, or is it because the compound yeah, participates yeah. lower? Mm -hmm. So this might be something for yeah, your yeah, successor for, to yeah, look yeah. at, not to underestimate the activity. Uh, I mean, um, when, uh, when I did the experiments, it was really uh, transparent. Yeah. So, we but stop. Yeah, yeah. Stop because yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank sorry. you. Thank you very much, Professor. Hanen. Um, the opposition will be continued by Professor Dr. Loza, and Professor Dr. Loza is a professor of pharmacology at the Universidade de Santiago de Compostela in Spain, and she is here with us online. Professor Loza, and, and she was also member of the assessment committee. Sorry for that. Please go ahead, Professor Loza. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, first of all, I, I am really sorry. I apologize for not able to, to be with you there uh, in person. I was really delighted and honored, but uh, it was not possible for me. So I'm very happy in any case to share this, uh, this um, committee. Um, 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 first of all, I would like also to congratulate you and your uh, supervisors because it's a very important uh, scientific piece of work, especially talking about drug discovery for uh, compounds in platelets, in platelets uh, uh, which are very difficult and sensitive cells for studies. So I, I really uh, was uh, very happy to see this impressive results and I think it's, a, it's an open it's an opening of a new avenue high throughput screening and ultra high throughput screening with these again sensitive cells and also I'm impressive for the very good papers you already uh, presented uh, with uh, of course um, expert reviews on this so 
uh, I can only say that uh, um, uh, I, I agree. And um, I, I see small details that I would like to, to discuss with you, especially talking about the future, right? For instance, um, in, in the case of um, these uh, responses that you see, small difference between, of course, the stimulus, but also between the, the size 384 or uh, 1536, uh, depending on um, one or two components um, that you characterize and describe very well. But I, I am wondering, is this a, a special calcium oscillations in blood platelets that are described uh, after the, the, the change in intercellular calcium concentration when appears an external uh, stimulus that changes a lot and induce these um, oscillations in both uh, frequency and amplitude. And if this, uh, uh, you think that uh, these dynamics could be uh, related uh, and uh, could help uh, to go on with the analysis in the fighting. In the fighting, I see that um, in the fitting. Sorry, I see the peak, the area under the curve, and the slope are the, the of course, perfect uh, indicators. But uh, I was wondering if a complete uh, fitting of the curves. Uh, taking into account steady states, uh, one or two uh, components, and, and try to go on, uh, you think that these oscillations and to control this uh, could be important in these uh, measurements? Talking about future, right? And how to continue uh, to doing more concrete and much and much um, uh, better results that although are correct, of course, for high throughput, but especially thinking about to go on with mechanisms and details that you describe in the, in the PhD thesis as to be done in the future. El estimo Ponen, thank you uh, for the compliment and uh, for, um, uh, for the question. So <laughs> regarding calcium dynamics, uh, yeah, I, I understand that it it is a lot of parameters that we extracted from the curves, and uh, maybe some of them, uh, they do not look very um, yeah, useful for uh, drug discovery. But um, having an algorithm that can really characterize all these parameters at once, because it's what the algorithm did, uh, can not only give us information whether it is a hit or not a hit, but it also informs us whether there was uh, fluorescent, because we measure uh, before adding the agonist, or whether it was toxic, for example, because toxic compounds can increase uh, uh, calcium uh, to very high levels. Um, so using these, all these, uh, or for example, the ba basal parameter, could inform us of other um, other information <laughs> um, that uh, we could not obtain if we only uh, measure the calcium increase or the slope. It is true that um, there are more uh, some parameters maybe are more discriminative than others, but um, having all of these uh, it helps to identify the, a bit where in the pathway they may affect. Because uh, if they only inhibit at the end, so at the slope two or a slope three, then it, it means that they may be affecting the secondary, uh, the, um, the part uh, where the um, secondary mediators further activate the platelets, not really at the beginning where the tryosine kinases have an effect. So, yeah, that's, that's why we really looked into all these parameters to really see, okay, are we interested in finding a molecule that we'd, would affect at the beginning? Because we know that there are uh, already sick inhibitors that they were very promising, but at the end they have bleeding side effects. Or do we want some other inhibitors that affect that other point in the pathway? So, yeah, that's... Um, yeah. Of course, and this is a major uh, result of your research, but uh, but 
But my my question is more that uh, that of course I agree with you, but it's more about these uh, calcium oscillations depending of the external factors because I was wondering if these external factors could be also related with the well plates uh, size, right? If this uh, could be considered in your um, inclusive analysis of these parameters, right? Uh, uh, are in external calcium or um or like the heat or um, for example yeah so um yeah uh, i think if um like for the future <laughs> if somebody else does these uh, experiments for example room temperature and then at 37 degrees or even um uh, 25 30 uh, 37 and then having the differences in the curves um, then it can be implemented in the assay because then you will have uh, the differences. Uh, but um, I don't, I don't know if it will change that much with the temperature. Um, uh, yeah, the the only issue that uh, I had with these really small plates it was the dispensing of the plates because with the certus device that dispenses the, the platelets, because we had a such a high concentration of platelets, the platelets um, clock the device. So we really um, had to clean it um, from time to time to avoid that. And uh, that is uh, not a, a scientific um, issue, but it's a practicality that uh, delays all the experiments. So, um, that I don't think it can be implemented <laughs> in this uh, algorithm. Um, uh, but uh, I, I cannot think now uh, about other external uh, factors. Um, yes, uh, the, the last one about this. Yes, um, just the last one about this. Uh, this, uh, the end of the, of the result in experimental result with the algorithm, I think you can extrapolate. And uh, in some curves, I see that it's a clear steady state, but in others, I was not sure about uh, in the evolution, um, in the analysis, depending of the, of, the, of the stimulus. You know, at the end, if it's stable or it's changing in, in the time. If you, in the, in the algorithm you prepare, you make, right? Answer. Okay, please. <laughs> Sorry. Um, you mean at the the slope three curve that sometimes it's a bit going higher? Uh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But that can be because of the bleaching of the calcium. So that's why we only measure for an amount of time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Loza. But the time is up. Thank you. <laughs> We will continue the opposition with uh, Professor Dr. Deckman, and Professor Dr. Deckman is uh, Emeritus Professor of Biochemistry at the Catholic University of Leuven, Kulak uh, in Kortwijk. He was also member of the assessment committee. Professor Deckman. Thank you, Mr. Prorector. The candidate, I'd like to join the uh, Congratulations of the previous uh, assessors. This uh, really is impressive work with a wealth of different techniques and uh, uh, very, very impressive. I also very much liked your didactical way of summarizing this whole story in, into, what, 10 minutes, uh, which, is, which is really a, a challenge to do, of course. Um, let me start with a, with a short question. When, when you go um, selecting compounds, uh, you use CRP, which is a small uh, collagen-like uh, uh, protein, and thrombin. Mm -hmm. And thrombin, you, you state, yes, uh, thrombin is, of course, a larger protein, is an enzyme. So if you start screening for inhibitors, you might come up with thrombin inhibitors. Mm -hmm. um, Unless you want to find thrombin inhibitors, that's nice. But if you don't want to find thrombin inhibitors, would there be a way to, uh, to overcome that problem? Is there different uh, systems to do it? Um, highly esteemed opponent, thank you for the compliment and for uh, the question. Um, 
Yeah, as a to start, uh, I I would only think of using the two peptides specific for part one and part four, and then you don't uh, find thrombin inhibitors. Um, and if you use it in combination, uh, it it you will obtain basically the same, maybe some variations according to the different donors, but uh, really the same peaks, and uh, because it's the cumulative effect of, of uh, both receptors. Um, I I cannot come back uh, like. A, would, would you uh, choose uh, part one or part four as main target? Uh, I would choose the part one because it's uh, the one that uh, gives the uh, highest the, the the peak. So I and it's um, you need a lower concentration. So yeah, more, for drug more discovery. Prominent, yeah, prominent. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, that was uh, the short one. <laughs> then uh, chapter five, the, the ultra high throughput screening. Um, I had I had a very technical question, which I di didn't really understand what was happening. So you started off with a diversity based compound library. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's fine. Um, you uh, did the screening, and uh, then you got a number of compounds, and then you state. We filtered for in silico estimation of compounds with potential toxicity or with unfavorable pharmacokinetics or toxi mm -hmm. toxicity. And, and my question was like, why didn't you do that on beforehand? Because you had your compounds, you could already have screened for in silico, mm -hmm. in silico yeah. screening for toxicity and, and no longer test those guys. Yeah. Was, was there a, a this particular was, reason for that? This was my evolution as a PhD <laughs> student. <laughs> uh, so I, I was slowly finding tools to make this uh, pipeline more efficient. So um, because we did this screening in, um, uh, in a Pivot Park, so it's a company and they have all these robots, but we, uh, or I had to test this a uh, small set of compounds in Maastricht and we don't have these fancy robots. <laughs> so this was a way to really prioritize those that we were certain that would not be toxic and that uh, the effect it's uh, likely uh, to be just because of the drug and be favorable for further testing. Um, okay. Yeah, but it, it, it yeah, uh, indeed it is. So, <laughs> so my confusion was, was okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Then with that, uh, you, you finally came up with uh, etopropazine, mm -hmm. which you also mentioned in your summary here, and um, inhibiting the GP6 pathway. Mm -hmm. um, GP6, CLEC2, FCR mm -hmm. gamma 2 a uh, using similar pathways for platelet activation. And of mm -hmm. course, the question then is, did you check? Um, and I forgot the name again, etopropazine mm -hmm. on CLEC2 and uh, FCR uh, activation. So, no, I, I haven't uh, yet tested uh, this um, other agonist. For CLEC2, the, the thing is, uh, podoplanin, it's, a, it's a not so easy, <laughs> I, I think, to test in uh, calcium release. So, uh, all the labs use uh, rhodocytin, which is a toxin. <laughs> So it's not very physiological, but yeah, of course, CRP, it's also not a physiological agonist. Um, but yeah, short answer, no, I haven't tested them. And it's a very good suggestion. Yeah. So also the FC receptor, you didn't no, have a look no, at? No, no, I haven't. Because of course, it could give you an idea on yeah, oh, what could be the target of, of, the, of the compound. There. Yeah, so what I did is uh, use um, inhibitors, uh, like uh, in uh, the supplementary figure, um, Eight, I use a combination of inhibitors to, to try to pinpoint if there was an additive effect of using etopropazine on top of these inhibitors. So if there was an, an additive effect, then it is uh, either um, upstream or it is another pathway. But yeah, it is, mm -hmm. it is indeed a very good suggestion. Mm -hmm. OK. And then chapter seven. Uh, probably you did expect questions from me from <laughs> yes. chapter seven. Um, so there you go for the for the uh, you 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 design uh, these these uh, proteins um, on the A1 domain, mm -hmm. the, the separate A1 domain, the, the, the structure of that, and with the idea that you would have then compounds that would uh, only bind to act to extend it to act to open mm -hmm. however you want to call it formula factor yeah. my question is do you have evidence that 
what you then got was not binding to, say, resting volubrant factor. Could you do binding binding studies? No, so uh, yeah, we didn't do binding studies. We expect that it's binding because um, uh, because uh, yeah, the thrombine the thrombine were reduced by no, this. but I agree. Yeah, yeah. I agree. It binds and it works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but you, yeah, your yeah. idea is that that it would be better if you would have compounds that only act, that only bind to mm -hmm. exposed A one domain yeah. and and not to the closed foil factor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can discuss whether that indeed is, is needed or not, but nevertheless, you, you put that forward as, as, a, as a valuable aim, mm -hmm. and, but you didn't have any no, no, further we didn't, evidence no. that this was the case or not. No, we didn't do this, um, this specific yeah. ex experiment, like binding study uh, to see whether it binds to the A1 domain only. Yeah. Or yeah, or that's actually, really more in, more interesting, not bind to the yeah. A1 domain in the in the folded uh, mm -hmm. volubilant factor, yeah? Yeah. because the antibodies couple uh, of up at, and and the, I think the RAC 35 they do bind to resting mm -hmm. volubilant factor, uh, so it's not okay. the, the binding of the antibodies is not similar to the binding of GP1B, mm -hmm. so maybe yeah. there's a okay. yeah. but it might be it might be good. Um, the, for the sake of time, could I please switch to the other opponent? Okay. <laughs> Maybe <Shoot>. we can. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Degmeng. Um, the next opponent is uh, Dr. Campos, and Dr. Campos is Associate Professor at the Department of Pharmacology, Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Technology at the Universidad de Santiago de Compostela in Spain, and he was also a member of the assessment committee. Thank you very so much, uh, esteemed, estimated candidate, colleagues, and all the audience. First, I would like to take a brief moment to express my deep appreciation for this invitation to participate in this thesis defense in this beautiful city of Maastricht that I am visiting for the first time. So I want to, to offer my congratulations to the candidate and the supervisor for this exceptional work. The quality of the study beyond any doubt, certified with several high-rated uh, articles. And uh, also, uh, um, I want to, to congratulate you for your brief presentation. It's very difficult to, to resume all this thesis in 15 minutes, and you have made a really uh, an effort very commendable. So since, since we don't have enough time for a long discussion, I just have a few curiosities and comments. Some of them ha have already been commented here. First of all, it's about calcium again, but I, I will just, just uh, make a very brief question. So do you think that you can, um, in some way, to adapt your ultra-high throughput screening, for example, using uh, medium without calcium, using blockers of intracellular calcium or FAPSI guarding or blocky, blockers of TRP channels, something like that to, to make your, your test more selective in an easy way, in an easy way without a lot of changes. I don't know if you understand the, the question. Team opponent, thank you for the compliments and for uh, the question. Yes, um, so the assay can be uh, make uh, uh, in a very uh, standardized way without calcium. Uh, I think, uh, 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 yeah, some of my uh, colleagues have uh, published recently a paper in which they tested the differences. Um, so the the only like to make it really easy like that. It's you just have the preparation of the platelets, and then you don't, um, uh, yeah, you have to add um, a low concentration of EGTA to block really the extracellular calcium, and uh, add all the inhibitors to really target the the pathways that you want to like, uh, or add tapsigargin, or uh, so then the whole bulk of platelets would be the same, and then you just dispense in the wells and. Yeah, um, with some agonies, maybe this is a bit uh, detrimental, so to say, because if they have a really small peak, then without the 
uh, intracellular, the extracellular calcium, then the peak would be really, really small, and that would really limit the finding compounds. Okay, okay thank you. So another thing I, I, I am always worried about is when we are talking of, of that kind of ultra high <laughs> throughput screening experiments, for me, this, there is a doubt which amount of compounds can, can be uh, out of the detecting system. Because, for example, in, in your chapter five, I can see that the difference in, in t statistics be between the experiments of 384 wells and 1536 mm -hmm. is quite high. Mm -hmm. So it seems that when you use a very big amount of wells, yeah some of the compounds that mm. are active could be lost. Yeah. So that's not the, fir time, the first time that mm -hmm. this happens in some high throughput screening studies or designs. So I, I have read the very interesting the chapter that you have included or the, the, the subtitle about robustness of, mm -hmm. the, of the test. But I would like to know your opinion about that. that is, are you really trusting this huge amount of wells that, that can be really accurate to, to detect all the compounds that could be active there. Yeah, so um, I agree. And I read the literature and there are many, uh, or well, maybe not many, but there are several papers that they indicate that they are uh, pref uh, preferably uh, using uh, the 384 rather than the 1536 because uh, to avoid uh, these missing compounds. The issue is that they, in, the, using 384, it increases the cost quite a bit. So it really depends on your budget. And the question, and yeah, of course, we can use an in silico tool earlier, and then that will probably help to set, the, the, set uh, a few compounds or a smaller set of compounds that it's more likely to target the, uh, the proteins or the pathways that you're more interested yeah. in. That's a good point, which yeah. is better to do less experiments yeah. or not. Yeah. Sometimes it's better to do less or yeah. to do yeah. more. It depends on the accuracy of the test. Yeah. So another one about, uh, another question about your feelings. So do you think I see, for example, the, the, the figure 7 in the page 65, when you compare the, the, how the platelets act under flow or under suspension. So my question is, do you think that from now on it will be necessary to work in flow to study platelet aggregates instead of working in suspension? Because the difference is it's yeah. very high, so yes. all, all these experiments, <laughs> previous experiments are not valid. We have no, to repeat no. everything. Uh, so, um, yeah, as I mentioned in the discussion, and as we mentioned before, <laughs> there can be advantages that can become disadvantages in some cases. And yeah, this year it's, um, it's very important, especially when testing platelets. However, the suspension assays uh, can help us to identify the targets. And yeah, and, but yeah, I agree that to really mimic the in vivo environment, we need to use shear and we need to use microfluidics. So that take, takes us to another question. Do, do we have to design high throughput screening in flow conditions? Yeah, that would be really cool. I mean, if we can design a, f a plate that has <laughs> all these small chips uh, with shear, but uh, I think that is like uh, from the engineering point, uh, stream, I don't know. <laughs> in, in my view, it's, it's extremely it's difficult. Yeah, yeah thank, thank you. you very much. Yes, yeah. thank you very much, uh, Dr. Campos. Uh, the opposition will be continued by Professor Dr. Philippou, and she is Professor in Translational, Translation of Medicine at the School of Medicine, University of Leeds in the United Kingdom, and she was also a member of the Assessment Committee. Thank you very much. First, again, I would like to start by congratulating the candidate for an excellent body of work that's been produced with, with, with high quality. So congratulations to the candidate and, and the promoters. So I want to start by asking you, in 15 years from now, 
what do you envisage the, the go-to targets will be for antiplatelet therapy and which modality? Uh, um, <laughs> okay, so highly highly esteemed opponent, thank you for the compliment and for the question. Uh, do you mean... Uh, so wh which targets do you think will be employed in mm, standard okay. of care? Um, yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, well, so uh, having in mind the um, uh, last clinical trials uh, with clenzosimab, even if they were uh, together with the current, uh, with the TPA or with, uh, yeah, the standard of care, uh, the current standard of care, I believe that at, at some point we would only use uh, clenzosimab. Um, maybe in 15 years from now, we can even have a small molecule that would mimic the antibody and then we would avoid the intravenous injections because, uh, yeah, that, that would be really, um, that, uh, I mean, when, uh, when uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Sure. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. And uh, do you think that it will ever be possible for a sick inhibitor to have the same the, uh, the same benefit as a selective GP6 inhibitor? Uh, no. So um, I, um, we use this uh, PRT06318, and uh, yeah, it, it in, in vitro, it has uh, similar to the same uh, extent of inhibition. However, GP, uh, seek targets uh, is downstream of other receptors, and then it is not specific, it is in other cell types. So the, the very amazing thing with GP6 is that it's only in platelets and megakaryocytes. So we would just have to look deeply what is the effect in megakaryocytes because we know what is the effect in platelets now. Um, so really I would just be concerned about that at the moment um, rather than trying to find uh, another yeah, target. Yeah. Okay, so, so given the experience that you've had during this PhD program, if you were to start this whole program again tomorrow from refresh, what would you do differently? <laughs> That's a difficult <laughs> question. <laughs> um, well, um, I think I would use all the tools like there are uh, on the internet, like uh, also uh, many more bioinformatic tools and the first thing I would do is just to join a bioinformatic course from the beginning and then <laughs> learn a lot about um, in silico tools and all these binding um, uh, binding motifs uh, to, to try to model uh, like the compounds because I think that would really help especially with the screening um, uh, but, but yeah, I don't know. There, there are so many things that sure, that so, I, so. I could have done differently. That at, at, uh, yeah, now I, I don't really know. <laughs> so, so, so for a screening cascade, yeah, um, take to take you through a lead optimization program. What, what, what would be your screening cascade? Uh, like from this, from the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. So I would do an uh, first an in silico uh, method to really uh, target a protein. Uh, so if we are looking inhibitors for GP6 or for, uh, yeah, um, PARS or uh, thromboxane 2 just see what are the motifs that may, may be more relevant to target. And I think there is plenty of knowledge already uh, in the literature and on the databases. Um, so, uh, yeah, I would start with that and then select maybe a small set of compounds, test them, see if we have something, and if not, then test more compounds. And uh, yeah, but uh, it's likely that if we have one hit and then we modify it, then uh, we will get um, uh, small molecules with uh, improved properties uh, at the last stages. So, more like an hit to lead uh, stage uh, rather than trying to fight a lot of hits and then, yeah, you are overwhelmed. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Filippou. Um, the opposition will be continued by Dr. Heubel Moonen and Dr. Heubel Moonen is hematologist 
at the Department of Internal Medicine at this university, and she was also a member of the assessment committee. Thank you. Dr. Urban. Dear candidate, of course, I would also like to congratulate you with uh, your work and also your team um, for your impressive work you have done on your research with uh, new techniques for antiplatelet drug development and also diagnosing uh, patients with platelet function disorders. So as a clinical hematologist, I daily encounter these difficulties and limitations of platelet function testing um, in patients with a bleeding tendency. And we also often find no clue why these patients bleed. Um, so I was very much interested in the chapters about the Maastricht flow chamber. Uh, so I want to discuss with you chapter eight, where you describe and investigate the flow chamber as an additional diagnostic um, technique for patients with a hemostatic defect. And you performed this analysis in patients with an already established platelet function disorder, um, with some also having a genetic defect explaining the platelet function disorder. And you showed that with the flow chamber, you could cluster the healthy controls <laughs> and the unaffected family members uh, on the one hand, and on the other hand, the affected family members. And this was more um, uh, clear when you also included the standard uh, platelet function tests. Um, so my first question is, if these patients are already diagnosed with a platelet function disorder by using LTA or flow mm -hmm. cytometry, what exactly is the added value of doing flow chamber in these patients? Esteemed opponent, thank you for the compliment and for the question. Um, yes, so <laughs> we got these uh, questions also in the revisions of uh, this uh, uh, manuscript. The, we we rephrase it because at the end, the aim is, re is not really to diagnose these patients, but to understand what we can do with this flow test to, um, to find the abnormalities or whether we can help uh, targeting the other tests. So, because we tested so many surfaces, so maybe we can um, really find um, some characteristics that we are missing in the uh, when we use isolated platelets or even in plasma and adding the, um, the shear we can see the effect and uh, maybe we can see yeah um, uh, yeah <laughs> the, that uh, the platelets are uh, morphologically different or the thrombi so yeah that it's um, um, something that it's not clearly explained in, in my thesis that it's... No, but your answer is yeah. very clear, yeah. <laughs> so very good. Um, so um, if you would think about what patient population you would use the flow chamber in, um, in the clinic, can you comment on that? Yeah, so if I, if I had the chance to use all the patients that I could uh, with the plane of breathing mm. disorders, then I would include them all because um, it would be very interesting to have a, a higher cohort so like imagine 120 patients with all these uh, unrelated bleeding disorders and see if all, just having the data, we could observe any um, differences because that's, that was the striking thing in that with just this data, we could observe this differentiation. And it's, it's not only because they, uh, these uh, thrombocytopenic patients have a low platelet count. It is a bit more. It is the platelet defects that they ha have that they make these patients separate. So if we can just increase um, to, yeah, even ju to just these uh, disorders and see what we can really um, gain from Hermansky and Putlat syndrome. I mean, there are several types, so even if we just increase it, I think it would be very good. <laughs> okay, thank you. So as a next question to this answer, I, I would ask the paranymph to read proposition number five, please. Microfluidic whole blood tests are coming one step closer towards implementation in the clinical setting. This thesis impact. So I think we are both a fan of the flow chamber. Um, and you said this is one step, but what steps are necessary if you want to measure more patients? Mm -hmm. Because I know it takes a day to perform the yeah. flow chamber and then more days to perform the analysis of the yeah. results. What steps do you need to really implement it in um, the clinic? So at this stage, to make it um, faster, just with the material we have now, it would be um, automatic script. 
and then at least that part it's done uh, faster and without the need of uh, an individual that has to do the all the image analysis then if we go even farther um, i think we need to make the chamber high throughput and that can be there are several chambers that are available that have all these channels uh, so even having six channels um, in a chamber i think that would make it easier because um, yeah you can even two channels uh, separately then you can test in one go all these um, uh, all these six surfaces that we had we needed two times because we needed two chambers um, uh, to could you comment on the use of artificial intelligence for better interpretation of the results yeah yeah I I, I mean when I said automatic scripts mm -hmm. I thought of artificial mm -hmm. intelligence yes um, it needs to be done with care because yeah if we with artificial intelligence it's like a black box then data enters and it, there is an outcome, but yeah, but uh, yeah, yeah, for sure the scripts, um, I think they can be trained and it would be very, very efficient to, to use them. Okay, thank you. Um, so my next question is, uh, you showed that the flow chamber could uh, detect platelet function disorder. Mm -hmm. Why couldn't it detect the differences in bleeding tendency or bleeding risk? Yeah, um, because we use children <laughs> and adults. <laughs> <laughs> Dear candidate, you have the liberty to answer the question or to stop your defense at this point. Okay, I will, I will answer. So, <laughs> uh, I think we couldn't detect the bleeding because we have children and adults. And I think there, there are some slight variabilities between these two that, uh, may, that may affect the detection. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, dear Delia Fernandez de la Fuente, the time appointed for defending your thesis has passed. The degree committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and your defense. I request that you and your company await the results of our deliberations and our return in the room. Thank you. All right, please. The PhD defense has now ended. The degree committee will debate the candidate's performance behind closed doors. This process usually takes about 10 minutes. is tied long road i don't waste no time break rules because fate decides with the team and we chase the light i make a move fall down shake it off i hate to lose bad branch break it off no room for negativity praise and love prepare for deep park because we're taking off Get the Then we go, 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 go. Oh, and even 
even though these nights seem long, I know that I am never on my own. Oh, you won the battle once you Outside. Ten miles in my rearview mirror. I know what it felt like. My goal's only getting clearer. East side to the west side. No place like home. If it's questions that you've got, go the extra mile and die. Long road to the south side. Ten miles in my rearview mirror. I know what it felt like. My goal's only getting clearer. East side to the west side. No place like home. If it's questions that you've got, go the extra mile and die.
Dear Delia Fernandez de la Fuente, the degree committee here present has assessed the quality of your thesis and your defense. And in view of its positive verdict, and taking into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. Professor Heemskerk is authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university custom. I invite you, your supervisor, to now take the floor. All right, please. So we first get the promise. Do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times, to be careful and honest, transparent, independent, and responsible? Yes, I promise. By the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present, I hereby confer upon you Delia Irene Fernandez de la Fuente, the degree of doctor, and grant you all rights attached by custom and law. As evidence of this, I now present you with the degree certificate signed by the rector, the secretary, and the other members of the committee, and affixed with the official seal of the university. So now we get the sequence of speeches. Uh, geachte Dr. Dr. Delia Irene Fernandez de la Fuente, dear Delia, it's a real honor for me to be the first person to congratulate you with this now obtained double doctorate. And in my congratulations, of course, I also include your family, relatives and friends present here or attending the ceremony online. At both the universities of Maastricht and Santiago de Compostela, you have been working very, very hard, and you have progressed quite a lot with as result this thesis. Your 290 pages thesis, I think, is a superb piece of high quality scientific work, and all Corona members uh, here present agreed that the defense of it was very good. Hence, the bill handed over to you is certainly well deserved. So congratulations again with the high quality of the work. Going back, I still remember when you arrived in 2018, coming from Birmingham, where you were at the time the last student in the TAPAS program, and you were the youngest in terms of age and years in my research lab. And now four and a half years later, in spite of the, this challenging COVID period, you have developed to a highly experienced scientist capable to handle in a critical way complex experiments and to analyze complex data sets. It's sufficient to look at the title of your thesis. In fact, I think every word in the title indicates that this was not an easy study. And every chapter shows your ability and creativity to find new ways for understanding complex questions in a way useful for the clinic as well. It's also of course, a personal aspect, as you say yourself, the Freiburg tip was amazing, an unforgettable one. Also because I, uh, you got, if I remember well, you got two penalties for ex exceeding the speed limit when you were driving back home, while I myself got only one. <laughs> uh, for the audience to sketch the situation there, the three of us, uh, Delia and Paranymph, Isabella, a provincial, where all, with all our equipment were put in an arbitrary microbiological, biological laboratory there, of which the owner was on holidays and came back halfway the experiments and was not aware of the fact that we were plashing around with blood in this uh, bacterial-free environment. 
So that was quite quite a nice experience there. In the end, I think it was all set to peace after a while. And there was a wonderful trip with Professor Barbara Ziegler to the Schwarzwald, which appeared to be Delia's favorite wood. Still don't understand why. But <laughs> altogether, indeed, it was a nice a trip. Also successful with the blood paper being accepted three weeks ago. In addition, uh, also other trips were memorable. Uh, so you store the short and long stays at the PPSC screening center in Oz with another colleague, Bibian Tullemans. And the first trip, trip to Santiago de Compostela to set up the flow system over there uh, with extreme, diff extreme differences in quality between the Galician and Belgian food. Uh, this is between the two of us. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, this, by the way, went without ex exceeding speed limits. <laughs> now you're supposed to say because I was driving. Yeah. <laughs> um, yesterday, I checked it again. The count of your accepted paper is now 11. And there are at least six papers more that will come. And moreover, it's all in good journals or excellent journals. You have contributed to more than 14 abstracts presented during congresses more than seven times, so your work really has paid off in the international community. Importantly, the thesis work was not only done in Maastricht, but also at your second home university at Santiago de Compostela, and having said that, I hand over to your co-promoter in Santiago, Dr. Angel Garcia. Thank you, Johan. Delia, well, as you can see, I don't have anything written but uh, I just want to congratulate you once again. Um, it was a pleasure um, to supervise with my colleagues your thesis. I still remember when you first came to Santiago at the beginning of the tapas during the first year with Johan to set up the flow chamber assay. At that time, um, it was very useful also for us. We were thinking of so many things and then a pandemic came and struggled quite a lot uh, tapas program, unfortunately. But in those difficult circumstances, you achieve the maximum thing that a PhD student, when, the, when it starts, can achieve. And it's develop a mind as a scientist. And from the early days until now, I saw you growing, uh, especially during the year you spent in Santiago with us, and of course here as well, both things. And, um, and I'm very, very pleased. I uh, wish you all the best for your uh, future, scientifically. I don't know whether here or somewhere else. Um, um, I'm sure you will do well. So, you know, you leave behind a lot of friends in Santiago, so you can come to visit us whenever you come, uh, how you want. And I'm gonna end up by saying a few words in Spanish, with permission. Delia, un placer. Enorme haberte tenido en Santiago. Tienes allí mogollón de amigos, ya lo sabes. Aquí lo digo de manera informal porque igual no me entienden. <risa> y <risa> quiero felicitarte a ti y a, y a tu familia y amigos que aquí están. Y, y que sepas que, que vengas cuando quieras y que es un placer haberte tenido estudiante. Y bueno, ojalá todos fueran también así, como tú en este caso, que yo no me puedo quejar porque la verdad es que hasta ahora siempre he tenido suerte en ese aspecto. Así que, nada, enhorabuena una vez más. Well, uh, esteemed Dr. Fernandez de la Fuente, uh, dear Delia, I'm very happy and proud that I can be one of the first to congratulate you on obtaining your PhD. And also congratulations to your uh, boyfriend, to your family and your friends. <laughs> so you started the PhD project in October 2018 as ESR number 12 in the Tapas Consortium. And uh, I look back to how it all started and I found your motivation letter, which was from April 2018. And I can quote from that that you wrote, I am a dynamic, hardworking, and motivated person who, which is excited to start a PhD. And indeed, it was a very much a pleasure to have you in the team. Uh, you started together with the other uh, Tapas students, Natalie, Ilaria, and Isabella, who is now your paranin. Uh, on the joint, you first did a joint project, 
to uh, obtain experience in platelet methods, but also um, to generate data for a joint publication. And also during this project, you already started to develop the assay uh, to measure calcium changes in platelets in the 96 well plate, which you refine then further uh, into the high throughput assay that you presented here so nicely. And you were always motivated and cheerful, and we always enjoyed your contagious laughter, which sometimes we could hear throughout the whole department. <laughs> so <laughs> we already missed that a lot. Um, so during your PhD period, you also performed experiments in other labs. This is also mentioned by Professor Heemskerk. And you went to Pivot Park Screening Center to screen more than 16,000 compounds for their effect on platelet calcium signaling. And this was actually a tremendous effort, which was not easy. But of course, you succeeded with some help from people of our lab and also from PPSC. But you really persevered in this project. Uh, once, you even ended up staying there during the night, <laughs> which is a story that we have to come back to another time. <laughs> um, you also went to Freiburg, to the, to the lab of Barbara Seeger, as uh, Johan mentioned, and uh, you went to Santiago de Compostela for a year for your secondment, uh, as Angel uh, has mentioned. And you presented your work during several international conferences in Cambridge, in Milan, and in London. So it was a great pleasure for me to be your supervisor. You were always motivated and came up with new ideas for experiments and how to continue with projects. The analysis of the screening assay also was not easy and very difficult, um, and also something that we in the lab had not done before. But you then reached out in your own network of friends to help you walk the paths of the unknown. Um, and there were also sometimes stressful periods during your PhD, for example, during the COVID pandemic. But you hang in there and kept going, and it finally resulted in the excellent thesis and your outstanding defense today. And I think you can be very proud of yourself for what you have achieved. I'm very sure uh, proud of you and I would like to end uh, this laudatio by thanking all the members of the assessment committee Professor Hane, Professor Loza, uh, uh, Dr. Heuvel Moene, Dr. Campos, Professor Dekmein and Professor Filippou for their time to evaluate and approve the thesis and also thank you very much for your presence here today and your uh, participation in the corona also on behalf of the other members of the supervisory team. So, dear Delia, I wish you lots of success in your upcoming career and all the best for the future. I hope that you will enjoy all the beautiful moments that are yet to come and start with today because it's your PhD celebration. Thank you. Thank you. Dear Dr. Fernandez de la Fuente, I, and also on behalf of the uh, University Maastricht, uh, wish to congratulate you with this honor, with this achievement. And uh, it was an achievement with uh, extremely uh, quality, so it was a very good quality. And you participated successfully in a very prestigious uh, project, uh, the TAPAS project of your promoter and co-promoter and along the lines of their program and that is uh, a very strong line of programs and i think that i looked at your presentation and there i for the first time i saw the essence of this program happy platelets having a party <laughs> and you as researchers crashing that party with experimental medicines it was very good I wish to congratulate you and your family and your boyfriend. And I wish also the best of luck for your future career, also on behalf of the university. And as already um, spoken by uh, the Jungi uh, Laudatio, I want to uh, thank also the members on behalf of the university for taking part in this uh, ceremony, for their contribution and being here, and also Professor Loza, for joining us from a distance. And before ending this, concluding this session, I have a uh, home uh, met of um, uh, some point to uh, address, and that is we are going to take a photo with the degree committee, 
with the candidates or the doctor <laughs> in this case. And I would like to ask the audience to go already to the rafter where uh, the um, uh, reception will be held. Having said that, I would like to give the final word to Professor Loza because she is not joining us uh, to congratulate you on site. Oh, thank you. Professor Loza, maybe you want to address the young doctor. Thank you very much, uh, Florector. Thank you very much for the opportunity of participate and again for uh, par uh, participate and take the, the, the qualification of this excellent work. Congratulations to all the supervi supervisors. Uh, and also, uh, I am very happy to share with you the committee members that made an excellent discussion and to see the new uh, PhD doctor, uh, Irene de la Fuente, Delia Irene de la Fuente, to see how well she is going to progress. And I also would like to say that we are very proud from here, Santiago de Compostela, uh, from uh, Dr. Angel Garcia, and for the time that Delia uh, Irene Fernandez de la Fuente stay with us. In this center, I am now the director of the, of the center. Uh, I'm uh, also part of the research uh, group uh, in, in which uh, Dr. Garcia is participating. So for us, it's also a very good day, a holiday day for us, uh, for these very good results in this excellent TAPAS program that you mentioned. Thank you very much. The only sorry for, my, for me is not be able to share with you now also the celebration. Congratulations. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Loza. One, one um, short uh, uh, request is, could you stay online? Because I propose that we make a photo here in front. Good. Yeah, and, and you project yeah. it on the screen, yeah. so you are in fact, a part of this uh, ceremony. Then we go. We are going to. We are going to do that. No, no, please. Oh, she's. Yeah, <laughs> very good. Oh, oh, sorry. For before. No, 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 no. I before closing this academic session. I think we need a formalization <coughs> because it's a double doctorate. You have a double doctorate together with the University of Santiago de Compostela. And on behalf of this university, Dr. Camos will officialize what we've... So it's just, it's just that as a representative of the University of Santiago de Compostela here, I would like to congratulate you for this very, very nice work, your supervisors, and uh, we hope to see you again in Santiago, working with us and for many years, working anyway and anywhere. And uh, so just in the name of the University of Santiago, parabéns y muchas felicidades por este título. Doctora por la Universidad de Maastricht y por la Universidad de Santiago de Compostela. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. So what will happen now is you will go to the rafter and wait for the young doctor to be congratulated by you. And we will first take a photograph here, together with Professor Loza, and then we go to the stairs mm -hmm. and take another picture over there. Mm -hmm. And with having said that, I hereby close this academic session. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs>